Institute today that was founded by my grandfather, Shaheed Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. Uh, nowadays, though, in the world, English, Urdu, is I'm English. Um, nowadays, all over the world, the prominence of, the prominence of think tanks uh -huh. and their impact on uh, policy making uh, is obvious to all. But surely, in the 1970s, it perhaps was not obvious to all. And it shows the vision and the foresight behind the establishment of this institution. Pakistan is blessed with incredible intellectual capacity. Our uh, intelligentsia, our civil society, our uh, educational institutions uh, produced a, 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 a metaphorical uh, army of thinkers. And Pakistanis have a unique uh, advantage over so many other countries because our presence, our population is not confined to Pakistan. I would say that uh, Pakistanis are present in every nook and corner of the globe. And we contribute to uh, all walks of life internationally as well, but Bahabi. Uh, Pakistani students, uh, I was one uh, far recently, far more recently than much of you, uh, uh, are a large segment of the population of international students at any given university in the United Kingdom, in the United States, and even in many universities in the US. And that means that if we were to effectively engage the intellectual capital of Pakistan within and without the country, particularly to engage with the youth who have a stake in our future, but also those who've reached the pinnacle uh, of their careers and have gained a lifetime of experience. If Pakistan was to conduct informed, uh, I'd say foreign policy, but actually informed policy making in general, that was a result of a healthy and open uh, debate and dialogue. We would be better for it as a country. So I would very much like for the Foreign Office to at least work in close coordination uh, with your institute and engage uh, the hardworking individuals over here, I'm not necessarily saying that everybody will agree on all topics, but surely uh, with your contribution and with your uh, input, we can uh, conduct uh, a far more informed foreign policy. And the importance of foreign policy, I don't need to uh, remind all of you. It is not only is a question of Pakistan's national interests, our security interests, or our economy, economic interests as a, as a theoretical subject, but it is a direct impact on the lives of every single Pakistan. And the Pakistan's discourse on foreign policy, unfortunately, does, it does not rise to the level that is necessary, particularly in the public domain, to educate the people of Pakistan, to explain to the people of Pakistan okay, the, the actual context of our foreign policy, what is happening in the world today and how it affects your lives. We like to paint the world in black and white, in good and evil. And perceived context, uh, concepts of what is in our national interest based on a narrow perception of nationalism and patriotism.
and what one must understand is if one is truly patriotic, then one is ready to do whatever is necessary to safeguard the interests of the people of Pakistan, to advocate for the interest of people of Pakistan, and achieve what is strategically necessary in your country's interest. I would argue that recently, we have continued to go down this path in an extremely unhealthy manner that has actually had a direct negative impact not only on Pakistan's foreign policy, not only on Pakistan's national security or national interest, but also on the health of our economy and the lives of the average Pakistani. If I was to sum up the conduct, sorry, I'm talking about the political conduct, not the foreign office conduct. It's very professional. It genuinely is. But the political conduct of our foreign policy, and frankly, quite a lot of policies, has been one of cutting one's nose to spite one's face. And it requires all of us to have a deep rethink about where we stand in the world today and where we would like to see ourselves in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, in the next 50 years, in the next 100 years. And are we as a nation, are we as a country, doing all we can to position Pakistan, if not today, then tomorrow, in the best place for its people? And I would argue, unfortunately, we are not. Pakistan's uh, as, as sort of uh, stated in your uh, presentation, Pakistan's foreign policy is far more affected by the development of geostrategic, geopolitical events than many other countries. Pakistan's geographical location is such that we are positioned in a place that means that the developments of geopolitical effects have affected, had, have affected Pakistan directly in the past and will continue to do so in the future. Our neighbor to the north is China, our all weather friends. Whether we like it or not, we will never be able to change the fact that India is also our neighbor. And on the other side, we have Iran, from where I've just returned on my first official visit as foreign minister, and of course, Afghanistan. So it is very easy to see that the development of global geopolitical effects, events have had a direct impact on Pakistan. But have we been conducting ourselves in a way that engages with these challenges, sees them as not only challenges, but also an opportunity? I don't think we have been. Or if we have been, I'm sure we've been trying to, but there's a lot more potential which is just waiting to be unlocked, diplomatically, economically, culturally, politically, we believe that engagement is the answer. When I say we're cutting our nose to spite our face, I mean that if we're not even going to try and engage on the basis of one issue or the other, then how can we hope to impact or change the course of events? Because the decision Pakistan makes, I believe, not only has, it will change the course of events or the direction that our country will take, our people will take, our economy will take, but the decisions that Pakistan take, takes and its conduct will directly impact world events. 
Ambassador, you talked about the presumption, the way that most of the world is seeing global de events developing today, of global power conflict, great power conflict. Now, is this great power conflict in the interest of Pakistan? And can Pakistan do anything to mitigate, avert, or play its part, rather than increasing conflict, increasing tensions, but actually to reduce tensions, to play a bridge, to play a role, to enhance engagement. I believe we have in the past, and we can do so again. If it is in the context of our relationship with China, there is no doubt that Pakistan's relationship with the people of China will continue to grow from strength to strength. We are committed to our economic engagement. We have achieved quite a lot through the China-Pakistan economic corridor, and there's much more for us to unlock as far as our economic potential is concerned. But if the development of global events take the trajectory as you, we see today, then it surely doesn't serve Pakistan's interests that a great power conflict break out in our neighborhood. And the consequences for that, for our people and for our region, are significant. In the past, Pakistan has not played a role of an aggravator in such a conflict. In fact, Pakistan has played the role of a bridge. Pakistan has played a role of the bridge in the past between the United States and China in establishing diplomatic relations between the two countries. And there's rather than being perceived as, being, as it being inevitable for us to be sucked in to a great power conflict in the region. Pakistan still has the potential to play the role as a bridge between great powers rather than a divider. And that requires engagement. It requires engagement with the United States as well. And our relationship with the United States has also been heavily tinted by a specific security lens. We are, Pakistanis particularly, as I said, are so well positioned. If we engage with our overseas communities, if we engage with our intellectual capital, and if we engage with the United States, not just as a country, but as a people, to put across our point of view and provide not only economic opportunities for our people, but to play a role in reducing rather than increasing the tensions on the world stage. We've been, we have our issues with India. Pakistan and India have a long history of war and conflict. And to point today, where we have Serious disputes. The events of, two, uh, uh, of August 2019 cannot be taken lightly. The undermining or the attempted undermining of the internationally disputed status of Indian occupied Kashmir. The beginning of a process to undermine the Muslim majority and artificially empower the minority are such important issues for us that indeed we have to take them up in the most serious and most aggressive manner. They've formed a cornerstone of any conversation that I've had. Satya Zahn? 
अच्छा तो they form the cornerstone of any conversation that I've had since becoming a foreign minister. And indeed, it's an incredibly significant assault on the rights of the people of Kashmir. Then in May we had the delimination commission, and then uh, just recently the Islamophobic remarks of uh, officials. And all of that creates an environment in which engagement is very difficult for Pakistan, if not impossible. But I'd like to leave a thought for you to think about as we are talking to a think tank. That does it serve our interests? So do we achieve our objectives, whatever they may be, be it, be it Kashmir, be it the rising Islamophobia, be it the uh, Hindutva uh, sort of supremacist nature of the new uh, uh, regimes and governments in India. Does it serve our objective that we have practically cut off all engagement? That I, as foreign minister of Pakistan, as the representative of my country, not only don't speak to the Indian government, but I also don't speak to the Indian people. And is that the best way to communicate or achieve Pakistan's objectives? We don't have a trading relationship with our relationship to the East. And many will argue, absolutely, we should not. The environment is not as such, and given these outrageous assaults on our principled positions, it would be inappropriate for Pakistan to take such a step. But others would argue that this is just a continuation of that very same thought where we cut our nose despite our face. And Ambassador, when you were speaking here and you were explaining about the trajectory of great power conflicts in our region between US and China, you also mentioned that their economic engagement was one of the reasons that you didn't necessarily see it getting as bad as everybody predicts. And one wonders, if not now, but say when Shaheed Mohtarma Benazir Bhutto had engaged with her counterpart when she was first elected prime minister, or back various people and the various attempts that engagement has been, had been made. And if, that, if, that, if at that point in time, we had achieved economic engagement with India, and our economic engagement on both sides had been to such a level, that perhaps we would be in a position to more effectively influence Indian policy making, that if India's economic integration with Pakistan and Pakistan's economic integration with India was at such a point, perhaps neither state would be in a position to take such extreme positions. But unfortunately, if we followed the cut your nose to spite your face, and we don't even have that economic engagement, then perhaps we're in a position where we're less able to impact and to affect Indian, foreign, Indian policy making. And if I'm not talking, whatever I think about the government in India, whatever I think about the, uh, their policies, and we have very strong feelings on that, if I'm talking at them through the media, through press conferences and press releases and statements, and not talking with them, then am I able to actually effectively impact any sort of change in their lives? Forget about the government. If it's our principal decision that I will not, which I don't think has ever happened in the history of the course of time and man, uh, that a state, even in times of war, that communication 
between officials were not. But let's pretend that they was that that so that's a legitimate option that we go for. Surely talking to the people, engaging with the public, serves the interests of Pakistan. That despite the hyper nationalist nature of the Indian media, are we going to cede that space to them and them alone? Or do we not believe that no matter what policy or whatever position the government of India may be taking, surely we don't blame the people of India who we share thousands of years of history with for every single decision of their government. And surely if we were not, okay, so if we were engaged with government to state functionaries, that has its own benefit. But if we were engaged with the Indian media, with the Indian public, surely we would be better placed to advocate Pakistan's cause, Pakistan's position, to expose the abuses of their government directly to their people. I believe that these are serious topics the think tanks such as yourselves have been thinking about, but it's time for us to seriously get thinking about it. Because we, as Pakistanis, have to understand where we stand at this point in time. We are at a crossroads. It's an extremely different, difficult crossroads of human history. We faced a hundred year once in a hundred year pandemic that, as the ambassador said, is yet to be over. Millions have, di uh, millions have died, people are still dying, and global health is still at risk. The threat of climate change is real and something that we as Pakistanis at least can no longer deny. If Jacob Ad is experiencing 51 degrees heat in spring, if we are in what seems like a perpetual drought facing water scarcity levels of 60%, if our crop year after year suffers drastic damage, if there are fires raging from Balochistan to Khyber Pakhtunkhwa for 10 days on end, surely one of the greatest existential threats to man climate change will have an outside impact on a developing country, on a poor country like Pakistan. And then, because geopolitical events have a direct impact on our citizens, so we had an economic difficulties as a result of supply chain issues and the shock of COVID, and now, the Ukrainian, the war in Ukraine has a direct impact on the lives of average Pakistanis. We used to import a significant amount of our wheat, of our urea, from Ukraine. The international world is now facing sky high uh, fuel prices, and everyone is feeling the effects of inflation as a result, as a direct result of these geopolitical events. And this is a time where everyone is pivoting to economic diplomacy and focusing on engagement, engagement, engagement everywhere and anywhere they can. And it is unfortunate that human history will record, but it will record this. Then we were, when we were facing the existential threat of a pandemic and of climate change, the world decided to go to war, but that's what they decided to do. In Europe, there's a war, the tensions and conflicts threatening to spill out all over the place. Our own neighborhood, Afghanistan, I'm going to read your book, but, well is extremely at a difficult crossroads in their own history. Because of geopolitical events, we've never reached the true potential of our economic potential with our neighbors in Iran. 
And now we have to race against time. The unity government is inherited in Pakistan, but wherever you look, there's a crisis. Internationally isolated, internationally disengaged for one reason or another. Economically, you've inherited an IMF deal that is stale, that is out of date, that is pre-COVID, that is pre uh, of the fall of Kabul, that is pre the Ukrainian and Russian crisis, that is pre the global economic recession. But that is what you've got. Then you've inherited such economic decisions that can only be de described as a suicide attack on our economy, that not only make things difficult for Pakistan, but obviously make things incredibly difficult for the average Pakistani. You've inherited institutions that, partic that have faced challenges throughout our course of our history, but in our view for the last three to four years, um, have been playing an, rather than a constitutional role, a more controversial role, while we're hoping for a transition back to where it's constitutional role that poses its own challenges. And whether it is on the economy, whether it is our domestic challenges, whether it is our foreign policy, everybody has come together in this unity government to address these issues together. I'm manning our foreign policy and our international challenges. Others are manning their own uh, thoughts. And we're working together under incredibly difficult circumstances, not only for us and for the world. And it's time for all of us to start thinking of new ways to pa for Pakistan to conduct itself, internally and externally, with the sole objective of not best benefiting me or not benefiting any one individual, but benefiting the people of Pakistan over any perceived notion uh, of uh, hyper-nationalism or hyper-patriotism, the most patriotic thing we can do, as I can do, as a foreign minister of Pakistan, is to conduct a humble foreign policy based on the reality of challenges that face my country, to be firm in our positions, to be firm in communicating the interests of my people, but to never be arrogant. Because the we cannot afford it our country cannot afford it. So I'm once again extremely grateful uh, for this opportunity to address you today. And I look forward uh, for my ministry, uh, working closely with your institute, for us to think of race to together address uh, the challenges that we are facing. Thank you so much.